great pleasure to have Professor Wendy Doniger uh, here today with us. Uh, uh, we are doing, having this conversation for the Literary Universals Project, uh, a project that is edited by Professor Patrick Hogan uh, from the University of Connecticut. And uh, the main aim of this project is to document and identify how uh, there are many common patterns between the literary texts that we read from around the world and see how those understanding and researching about those patterns can allow us to uh, understand some things about the human mind and how it behaves and stuff like that. Uh, so before we begin, I would like to introduce Dr. Doniger briefly. Uh, she is Mirza Elia Distinguished Service uh, Professor Emerita of the History of Religions at the Department of South Asian Languages and Civilization at University of Chicago. She has written over 40 books, uh, including The Hindus and Alternative History, Redeeming Kama Sutra, Women's Androgyny and Other Mythical Beasts. She is among the most notable scholars of South Asian religions, mythologies and metaphysical systems today. Uh, she is also an, a very accomplished comparativist dedicated to exploring broad commonalities and differences underlying various religious systems around the world, including Hinduism, Christianity, Buddhism, as well as Jainism. Uh, her research and teaching more particularly are committed to exploring the intersections between religion, uh, uh, mythology, and identity politics, particularly based on aspects of gender, sex, and sexuality. So Dr. Doniger, uh, thank you very much for speaking to me today. Glad to be here with you. Uh, so, uh, and uh, just, uh, one more thing that I wanted to point out to uh, our listeners is today we would be talking up to Dr. Doniger uh, about her work on gender as it intersects uh, stories of religion and myth, but we would be focusing on one text in particular that I wanted to highlight for our audience. Uh, just a second. Okay. So this is the cover, The Ring of Truth, Myths of Sex and Jewelry. Uh, and we would uh, focus our conversations mainly on this and of course, then move into a larger uh, discussion on your work. Okay, let me get back. Okay, so our first question to you would be, uh, so over your career, you have written about a wide range of things, things as general and abstract as evil or dreams, and as specific as horses and jewelry. Uh, of course, your aim in most of these cases has been to situate these ideas, concepts, and objects within a broader tradition of mythology or religious metaphysical system. Uh, so my qu first question as we move into our conversation is what prompted you to study jewelry? Uh, why did you want to tell stories about jewelry? Could you? Well, thank you, Ara. Thank you for having me here at all. Um, and being so interested in my work, it's always flattering to be asked about your work. Um, I, jewelry is something, I mean, I, I focused on many other things in earlier books. Um, sometimes I focused on animals and um, sometimes on concept of evil. So, so I've chosen a number of different um, topics, which I felt um, were wonderful to study in India, but also I knew about as an American. So I always had two points. I'm not Indian. I'm an American person. I'm American Jew. I come from a certain period. So I have already a comparative basis 
which anyone has who studies any culture other than their own. So in a sense, we're all comparativists. If you read a story about China, you read a story about Nigeria, you become a comparatist. You say, oh, that's how they build those houses. We build our houses differently. So I feel that the defense of comparison, which has to be defended nowadays um, in the time of identity politics, begins mm -hmm. with the reminder to people who don't believe in comparison that they're doing it all the time, unless they simply never read anything except the town they live in. You can compare New York with Los Angeles and you become a comparatist. So, so I've always been a comparatist. I've always been interested in how other people think compared to how I think. Exactly. Isn't it strange? I mean, there's that wonderful line in Herodotus, how we bury our dead and the Persians eat their dead. Isn't it interesting, he says, how different people are. So I write, therefore, about the things I care about. I write about gender issues. I write about horses because I love horses. Um, I assume that I know something about my world. And then I say, and, and what about that world? What about India? So. I've always been interested in stories about jewelry. I've always been interested in jewelry. Um, in the beginning of the book, I tell a bit about my family history and a ring that I inherited, a crazy six part ring that a Russian prince had when he couldn't pay his bill in my great grandmother's Czechoslovakian hotel in Marienbad. You know, so there's a story there. I already had my own family stories. And then I became interested in how other people had different sorts of stories. I always go first to India because that's the culture I know best after my own. And I know the Shakuntala and the Ring of Recognition, that's a great ring story. And then afterwards, so that's the two points. I know, I know about the rings and I know about India and rings. And then I fill in with whatever else I know. I know some of Shakespeare because I go to the theater. Um, I know some of operas, and I began to see a European pattern. There were enormous holes in my knowledge. I know very little about China. I know very little about Africa. So I don't know about universals. Um, you only have a couple of points. If you have three points, you can make a, a stool stand up. Um, I have America and India, which are so different in their history. <clears throat> and I have some, <coughs> excuse me, and I have some other knowledges. And then I begin to think in more universal terms about men and women, women wear rings for one reason, men wear rings for another reason. And then I sometimes get into biological issues. And that's really, that's the universal. That's what we all have in common. We all have eyes and hands and so forth. And I began to feel that rings were dealing with a very basic biological issue, mm -hmm. which is that a mother always knows that she is the mother of her child. And the father does not know for sure that he is the father of his child. And this has enormous repercussions in, in the legal world and indeed in the world of mythology. And rings play an important part in that male desire, <coughs> sorry, in that male desire to make sure that the kid is his kid. Mm -hmm. So that's where I hit the universal after mm -hmm. going through all these intermediary steps, beginning with America and then India. And there are just lots and lots of stories about jewelry because I'm not the only one who's interested in it. Everybody's interested in jewelry. Thank you so much. Uh, that, that is really insightful and, and it kind of uh, sets the direction for where I want to go after this. So you, you did talk about like, like we are all comparativists from one way or the other and like we have to be able to see that uh, to really get into... Uh, the issue. So uh, in academia, there's often a pushback against the idea of universal. And uh, I would say rightly so, there are good reasons for that. Uh, there's the pushback against using a transcultural framework because many within the humanities and the social sciences believe that universality is synonymous to systems, uh, colonial systems or systems that would like in, enforce a point of view upon others. So, uh, however, in also in the majority case that those 
point of views that deny the universal often end up endorsing certain forms of parochialisms or saying that cultures are irredeemably different and they cannot reconcile. So you are someone who has engaged with both the ideas of universal and the particular. Like when you're talking about myths, you do show that, okay, this is com there are stories that recur cross-culturally, but it is equally important to focus on the particular at the same time. So coming from that point of view, how would you respond to this debate between universalists and particulars? It's a very tricky one. Um, I tried to deal with it years ago in a book <clears throat> called The Implied Spider, which is a defense of comparison. Um, not so much universalism, but a defense of comparison. Um, I'm also, I was a, a friend and a colleague of Mirce Eliade, who was probably the most famous of the 20th century um, universalists. He really was a universalist. He believed that all human beings believed in gods and so forth and so forth. So I've pulled back a great deal from that. And I do make a distinction between comparison and universal because it builds up from the individual. The universal assumes, so the British, they come to India, they say, where is your Bible? Mm -hmm. You have a religion, you must have a Bible. All religions have Bibles because we have Bibles. Mm -hmm. So you begin always from the particular, we have this and what do you have? And then you always found some Brahmins who said, well, Manu is our Bible or the Bhagavad Gita is our Bible. And then you're beginning this horrible a colonial imposition of uh, British ideas on Hinduism and the, the deformation of Hinduism in the Bengal Renaissance, which is just a Protestantizing of, of Hinduism. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that <clears throat> that's a very real danger and um, I'm aware of it, but I don't think it's an inevitable danger if you build from the bottom up. In other words, if you say, well, these are my stories about rings and you don't say, I assume that everyone gets married and exchanges a ring in the Christian marriage ceremony. You just say, rings are in my culture are associated with sexuality and they're also associated with marriage. So let's look at what India does. India also has rings. They're also associated with sexuality, but the marriage customs are very different. So you're immediately headed off from broad assumptions of how different cultural groups use the same symbols and yet they do use the same symbols. The ring is a great symbol. It's round, it's perfect. It fits on your finger very well. It's a form of jewelry that you can wear all the time. You take off your earrings at night. Most people take off their necklaces. Indian women do not, but a lot it is possible. There's something about the ring sticking on the finger, which is universal. And then the question is, yes, but what do you say about it? So you never stray into the assumption that the um, abstract associations from a particular thing like a ring are going to be the same abstract associations, but you say there's something important here mm -hmm. because it occurs everywhere. And then the question is, how does it change there and there? And in fact, is there anything in common? Um, biology is one of the very few things that people have in common. Um, and biology is already very various. You can't assume as one assumed uh, 50 years ago that everybody is heterosexual and so forth. We now know that biology is more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. But the association of rings with any kind of sexuality mm -hmm. seems to be widespread and so forth. So I think there are ways to be aware of the political misuses of comparison, to start from the bottom up rather than the top down, to mm -hmm. assume when you into another culture that they will be doing things differently from you, which the British did not assume in India, or if they did it differently, it was wrong. Mm -hmm. We do it right and they do it wrong. There are all sorts of assumptions built into imperialism, which are not necessarily built into the cultural study of stories mm -hmm. and rituals and the way people behave. Mm -hmm. So I think you need to be aware of the fact that there's a danger and that you elide the particular. Carlo Ginsburg is a great one for, 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 for the focusing in on the particular manifestations. But in the end, he does comparison as well, uh, witchcraft and different forms of witchcraft and so forth. 
So you, you start with your particular, you go into their particular, and then you go into their theorizing of their particulars. And you see that Indians have very different ideas about rings in many ways. So you have a kind of an overlap, like rings. You have an overlap of the place where there's a, there's a shared center where the two rings do overlap. Mm -hmm. But then Americans have these ideas, which are part of capitalism and the De Beers mines. There's a whole mythology that comes out of diamonds and the weird marketing of diamonds. Yeah. But at the bottom, you're still talking about the idea of a precious stone, which people all over the world are interested in precious stones. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you navigate between your interest in how a particular culture, America in 1950s got De Beers doing things, mm -hmm. and the broader issues of paternity and the use of, um, of rings as a way of binding women. Mm -hmm. uh, owning, marking, mine, 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 which seems to be very widespread um, and is, uh, is not, different people do it in different ways, but the, the biological fact that men wanna know who their kids are affects all these stories in different ways, but that's the universal. That really is the universal. Um, and in most mythological ideas, there are universals, everybody dies, Everybody is frightened of dying. Yeah. So you have mythologies of death all over the world. People tell stories about death. They don't all tell stories about shoelaces. They don't all tell stories about squirrels. They all tell stories about death because it's a human universal. And when you start doing that, you then you see how differently people imagine death, mm -hmm. but that there are a number of overlaps. There are a lot of similar ways, a beautiful heaven. It'll be much better after we die. That's a that's a universal hope, mm -hmm. a universal fear will be tortured after we die. Mm -hmm. um, you, you assume that human experience does produce certain universals and that political interests twist them and you try to avoid those twists. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is fascinating. And uh, what you say about like, there's some stories that have a universal ring to them over other like like and that that kind of uh, resonates with the idea that some literary cognitivists have like called like prototypical stories right mm -hmm. like in culture we have stories that rise up to the universal level in, like yeah. more so than other stories like fixing a car or something like that how we began who how our family began how our tribe began how our country began how our religion began People are very interested in origins. And since very few people have a good historical record of their origins, mythology comes in. Mm -hmm. You imagine what your origins might be, and there is only a limited number of ways you can imagine those origins. So, the, so there are patterns, mm -hmm. and yet they, 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 they branch off quickly into mm -hmm. cultural figures. But there are patterns. There are certain things that people do, mm -hmm. uh, and they tell stories. Everybody mm -hmm. tells stories, and they tell stories about certain things, and you build from that. Mm -hmm. Eliada was right about that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of truth in that. Mm -hmm. But you have to be careful where it goes. And then when you bump into imperialism, you have to back off. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think like uh, uh, now that we're talking about universals, the, the next problem that often scholars who like study universals is how do you how does one organize that study right like you have so much material confronting yeah. you and you're encountering it so uh, th there should be a model of studying them in an organized manner and that is something that the literary universal project tries to do right uh, the first task is of course to identify what may have universal resonance and then the next task at hand is to understand how to organize that study so that it, it becomes meaningful in that sense. And you have done that in so many of your works. Uh, you have done that in this book uh, where you're like, you, you, you record so many different stories about rings from all around the world, but how do you like organize it? How do you make it meaningful to the reader so that it makes sense, right? So you've like, 
created categories like signet rings, sexual rings, rings that fish eat up and are found later on, right? So can you talk a little about this organizational yeah. aspect? Of yeah. It's fascinating. You know, many years ago in the 1950s, I think, uh, a folklorist named Stith Thompson tried to organize all the folklore of the world into categories. So he had life and death. So you have death, then you have different kinds of death and then subcategories. And you had categories which were like A.5.3.2.A.6 where he got, and where there's only one story. He got all the stories in the world, which of course he didn't. He collected all the folklore he could possibly find and tried to sort it out into those categories. And that's one of the great taxonomic um, um, attempts as a taxonomy, it fails. It's sometimes very useful if you have a story to look it up and st still useful to look up stories in Stith Thompson, but mm -hmm. he didn't really cover the whole universe. You can't do that. So um, when I set out on a project, I usually just try to collect all the things I can find that seem to have anything to do with it. By the time I even decide to write the book, I already have a lot. I've already noticed. I say, you know, I keep finding these stories about rings. I think I'll put them together. Um, and then you, you sort them out. Um, certain things keep recurring. Um, there are things that you look for if you are a mythologist because you've been reading stories for 50 years and certain things jump to your attention that might not catch your, the attention of someone who hadn't been reading Sanskrit texts for, for all that long time. Um, so you notice that there are two stories on the same subject and there's one on the opposite subject. And I guess you sort them out by the things that matter to you. If you're interested in gender issues, you sort them out by gender issues. If you're interested in plot lines, I've always been interested in deception and fakery and doubling and twinning. Then you look for all the doubles and the twins. Um, someone else who wrote a book about rings would write an entirely different book. Mm -hmm. I have not begun to say everything that could be said about rings. I've said the things that interest me about rings. And the taxonomies are those which, which interest me. I sort them out according to the things that, that, that seem to be repeated, but they catch my eye. You could sort them out by stories about rubies and stories about emeralds. I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. That would be one way to do it. So I did stories about virgins and stories about bad people and so forth. The themes that have become part of your vocabulary, just like the words you learn from reading. There are story themes that you learn from reading stories all your life. Mm -hmm. And then you try to make sense of it. You just, in the old days, we had three by five cards. You did it on the floor. Or with animals, under animals, you do dogs and horses. Under horses, you do stallions and mares and so forth. Um, you just sort them out into subcategories. You choose your big categories by the things that seem to you humanly important. And then you just put every story you have falls in some place. And you feel, and if you do it this way, it comes that way. And if you do it that way, it comes the other way. Sometimes you change your mind halfway through, you realize that you've lumped two things together that are separate and you have to write them, you change it. Or you've tried to write separate about rubies and emeralds and you realize no the emerald stories are really the same as the uh, ruby stories that's not a significant difference in south india the pearl stories are special because you have pearl divers so you'd separate the pearls out there whereas pearl stories in europe may be the same as diamond stories and so forth so you you move the pieces around the board until they start clicking um, in ways that make patterns that allow you to say something meaningful about each of your categories. Um, and if you have an empty category, you throw it away. Mm -hmm. You can't say anything interesting about it, you don't say anything. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an art, it's not a science. It's a, an attempt to find meanings that interest you and that will interest your readers. You want someone to say, you know, that's exactly how I always felt about my mother's ring. <laughs> And then you, then, then you have done it. Then you've achieved, uh, you've written an interesting book. 
That is fascinating. And, 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 and as it turns out, like even like the organization, you have to like consider the demands of the particular, the way like specific realities would like alter uh, or change a particular pattern. And that needs to be recorded and that needs to be classified and like uh, studied in that sense. Uh, and that is that is fascinating. Like, thank you so much for answering that question. That was a good question. Uh, now, uh, I do want to uh, go back a little to the uh, to the thing about rings. Uh, I I I wanted to ask you this question before and kind of uh, skip my mind. Uh, you do in in the book. You have a focus on. A lot of different kinds of jewelry, right? Necklaces, bracelets, uh, but you keep uh, returning to the ring. And you've like answered this question like in your other answers as well. But I wanted you to talk a little more about it. Why the ring? Is there something that is more universally uh, mm -hmm. resonant about yeah. the ring over, like, say, a bracelet or a necklace? Yeah. I broadened it in some chapters to circular jewelry because there are some wonderful stories about uh, bracelets and necklaces as well. Um, the ring stories are most important in um, Jewish and Christian and European uh, culture and Indian culture. Mm -hmm. um, Indian culture also has a lot of nose rings and anklets. Mm -hmm. So Indian culture is not quite so ring centric as European ones are. Um, but from the time of the Bible and all the cultures that draw upon the Bible, which of course includes Islam, mm -hmm. you, have a, you have a big cultural area, which is not universal, it's cultural. Mm -hmm. They tell the same stories because they read the same books. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to even reach for universals. You, you, you're dealing with a, um, a culturally shared area of Indo-European and Semitic. Mm -hmm. combined, as they do in the Mediterranean, where rings are associated with marriage. Yeah. So you don't give a necklace to your bride, you give a ring. So there was an enormous cultural area, which was accessible to me, uh, where rings were really the subject, were linked with the control of sexuality. And so that was a big theme. Mm -hmm. um, and that really was the theme of the book. The subsidiary theme was the way some of the stories that um, Semitic and Indo-European cultures, cultures tell about finger rings are told in other cultures about necklaces and anklets and so forth. So I, I, I kind of, that's a peripheral part of the book in a way. Mm -hmm. that there are other kinds of putting a ring around a neck or nose rings and so forth. Um, so it was my central area um, and that and then I, and then the broader area was women's jewelry. Men also wear jewelry, but women's jewelry is much emphasized in most cultures. Mm -hmm. And the connection then between jewelry and beauty, mm -hmm. and beauty as a feminine desideratum, and so forth. So, so that was the penumbra. That was the peripheral area after the central thing about giving a woman a ring to make sure that her children would be your children, which is the bottom line. And the other stories are about other aspects of rings, which are also interesting, but um, not as central to my argument. Thank you so much. And I, I think um, you also like talked about our next topic of conversation. So it's it's a good like move, uh, tra uh, transition into uh, my question about your exploration of identity politics uh, based on sex, gender, and sexuality. So uh, your books are like through myths and through explorations of stories about religious and metaphysical systems you often talk about identity politics and like uh, you often uh, describe how sh these stories are in a way some most generally they confirm certain predominant thoughts about gender and sexuality in any society. Sometimes they dismantle those ideas, but you are majorly interested in that. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and many of the stories that you talk about in your in this book is about that, how like jewelry is used often by men to control women. And some of those categories, like the good woman as opposed to the cunning woman, the slut assumption are all like commentary on um, uh, perceptions of gender and sexuality in society. Mm-hmm. So, and then, and that also brings me to some specific examples like you discuss in Shakuntala, right? Like uh, how uh, Kalidasa transformed the original Mahabharata story into something that was more, in some ways, a little reductive gender-wise, right? Like where, where uh, he, he kind of infantilized Shakuntala and like, apologize for Dushyant's terrible behavior. And like, yeah. th- this is the kind of pattern that's not specific to Shakuntala, but many other stories about yeah. from across the world. So can you talk a little about uh, this aspect of your study? <clears throat> that, that's the fun of it really, is the variations. That's why I love a story that's retold in different ways. So they're told by different people. So Generally speaking, in the ancient period, the texts are controlled by men. Women didn't have writing. Women were the storytellers. They're always the storytellers. So the stories, you hear it from your mother, you hear it from your nurse, you hear it from your nanny, you hear it from your granny, but you're the one because you control writing and women didn't control writing, that gets to tell it your way. So you get the stories with a male bias in the early period, Mm -hmm. Um, in the early texts. Then you get um, retellings, and there are also individual biases. So even within the tellings of of male um, authors, male scribes, you get, for instance, in the Kama Sutra, which is composed by a man, he tells us his name is Mm Batsyayana, but his ideas about women are so much more liberal Mm -hmm. than the ideas of other men who wrote uh, the Dharma Shastras. So he changes everything for women. Um, the Dharma Shastras say that the only reason that you have sex is for fertility and the only woman to have sex with is your wife and it's all for having babies. And the Kama Sutra says babies have nothing to do with it. Um, never mind babies. The whole thing is about pleasure and, and there are all sorts of women you can have sex with who aren't your wife. So this is a guy, he's still a guy, um, but he's a very liberal guy. So the Sanskrit texts of, of the ancient period say that all men have sex with women. Um, there's somebody called a Kleba who we don't even want to talk about. There's something wrong with him. He may have sex with men. He may have sex with animals. He only has daughters. Maybe he's castrated. It's all put together in this bad word for a man who deviates from the male sexual norm. Kama Sutra doesn't use that word. It said there are three kinds of genders, we would say, natures. There's men, there's women, and then there's a third nature, which is a man who sometimes has sex with men and sometimes has sex with women. That's all. So you just get an individual, aside from gender and aside from chronological period, who happens to be much more liberal. <laughs> and there are stories, I mean, my book, The Hindus, an alternative um, history, the alternative is within Hinduism. It finds these voices, starting in the Upanishads. There's a woman in the Upanishads, Gargi, who makes monkeys of all the men. She talks them down, she knows things. There's a man who's a great sage, Yagnavalkya, that he doesn't even know who his his father was. His mother was a servant who, who slept around. She cleaned different houses. So you have moments when regardless of gender or, or the genre of Sanskrit, you have alternative voices. You have people speaking out against the caste system all through. So there are these, these, are these alternative voices. Then you finally get, um, and, and Kalidasa was an alternative voice in a negative way. He was much more of a sexist than the author of the Mahabharata. They're both men. They probably were Brahmins because they they knew Sanskrit. But the author of the Mahabharata depicted Shakuntala as a feisty woman who talks down the king and makes a fool of him and wins what she gets. And Kalidasa said, no, no, no. She was just a poor girl. She didn't know what she was saying. 
Um, so you lost ground there. You get folk tales tell, told by women, and it's very often that the women are smarter and more successful. So you have different voices telling the same story mm -hmm. and telling the same story differently. And it's sometimes because the gender of the storyteller is different. It's sometimes because the genre is different. Mm -hmm. Folklore has less rules than Sanskrit in that way. Folklore has its own rules too. Um, so that's the fun of the variants, where you realize that within a single country, sometimes let's say Bengal or Tamil Nadu, mm -hmm. over the years, the story is told differently. They say, well, that's not how the story goes. I think the woman should have said this. Mm -hmm. And you see individual human beings saying, I like that story, but I think I'd like it better if. And you hear these different voices of people all over India telling the same story differently. Um, and it gives you a wonderful picture of individual free thinking and freedom. You don't simply parrot the way your granny told it to you, you tell it differently. And gender standards change and the, the stories can be told very differently in different, in different ways. Um, there's a wonderful new book that's just been published called Many Mahabharatas. It is taking off on Paula Richmond's book, Many Ramayanas. Um, and there are lots of ways of retelling the Ramayana and retelling the Mahabharata in which the Ramayana is in which Sita yells at Rama and gives him what for also, you know, it's a, it's a great storytelling tradition in India. And people change their ideas about gender and tell the same stories with a different gender uh, viewpoint entirely. And I find that just fascinating and very, very hopeful. They're not brainwashed. They, oh, well, Sita does exactly what Rama says. Even in Valmiki's or Mayana, Sita doesn't exactly do everything Rama tells her to do. If you read it carefully, she's a pretty feisty lady. But one thing, she leaves him at the end. She walks out on him, mm -hmm. um, which, which the nice Hindu wives are not supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So even in this classic text, um, if you read it carefully, um, you see that there are, there are voices of dissent. Mm -hmm. even in the old text and certainly in the later text. So um, I've always just celebrated those voices. I didn't have to invent them. Mm -hmm. They're there. They really are there. The gender dissent is very strong in India. So uh, a quick follow up to this. So today there's uh, like about going back and reading history and mythology. There's often like a dual issue that comes with it. Either, either people tend end up like idealizing the past, which itself can be problematic. Like it is like all good. Or it's just like, oh, the past is terrible. Like it was so, so much worse for like women and minorities. So how, what would your recommendation be? Like, how does one read the past in that, like with this duality in mind in that sense? I think uh, the past, influences the present. Mm -hmm. So that when you say, how did we get into this mess? One of the answers is it got messed up in the past and it got more and more messed up. At the same time, we're not bound by it, just as there are these alternative voices in the telling of stories. So there are moments at which people have said, you know, we've always done it this way, but I think we should stop. Very often there's a single brave individual who has the courage to say, you know, maybe we should stop doing it the way we've always done it. So you have to read the past to understand how you got into the mess you're in today. You have to know how it did, but you certainly don't have to go on doing it that way. In fact, it sometimes helps you to know why you are having such a hard time changing. Why can't you just suddenly in America treat people of color decently? Why can't you just say, well, let them all into the schools instead of keeping them out? Mm -hmm. Well, it's because they can't go to the schools because they're poor, because you've also economically deprived them. So you have to fix that before you just say, well, all Harvard will take in, Harvard will stop taking only white people. It'll start taking people of color. You can't do that. You go back to the past and you realize that there are deep social problems which have to be solved before you can simply start employing it and so forth. So you need to know the problems you're facing when you try to fix something that you now know you've been doing wrong for 10,000 years. Um, but certainly you need to know that the past 
explains why you're in the mess you're in, but does not explain how you're supposed to go on doing it forever. And that the past was wrong about a lot of things and you've got to free yourself from it. The fact that my grandfather did things this way explains why I'm inclined to do it, even though it's stupid. Mm -hmm. And why it's sometimes hard to change, even though I know it's stupid. Mm -hmm. But it means you must change because you now know it's stupid. You've got to stop doing those things. So uh, the fight about uh, the history of Hinduism mm -hmm. um, with uh, the Modi government, um, the idea is no one ever ate cow in ancient India, and therefore we kill all the Muslims because they eat cow. Mm -hmm. So it's rather important to point out that people ate cows in ancient India. Mm -hmm. It's simply not true that even if you're using them because they did it in the past, we're doing it now, which is stupid, you can't even make that argument. You have to counter false history with real history. Um, and that's why the work of uh, Professor uh, Aja, who just died a little while ago, was so brave. And he simply pointed out all the evidence there was uh, mm -hmm. for the fact that, in fact, people ate cow. And that it was only in the 19th century as part of an anti-Muslim movement in India mm -hmm. that the idea that no one in India should eat cow became an important idea. It just wasn't there in the old days. Mm -hmm. So knowing history correctly sometimes helps you to fight against the false use of history by politicians. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to know the past, you need to have access to texts and you, and you need to listen. Mm -hmm. It is all sorts of, the idea that Rama built the bridge to Lanka in the place which now connects Sri Lanka and therefore you can't have shipping go through it. Um, it costs the environmental destruction and the loss going around that place where there is no bridge because Rama did not exist and no one ever built, no one ever got a lot of monkeys to build a bridge to Sri Lanka. That's false history. Mm -hmm. No one stood up enough for false history to allow people to change the shipping lanes, which was the thing to do. The only reason not to put ships there is because you believed in a mythological bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, so India has often been unable to resist the powerful political misuse of history. Um, the idea that there was that Babur, um, that Rama was born in the place where there is now a mosque, or not now a mosque, there was a mosque until 1980. Mm -hmm. The false idea that Rama was born there caused the, 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 the loss of, of hundreds of thousands of lives. It was false history. And there was irrefutable evidence that it was false history. Uh, but the politicians won that one and therefore the riots and the tearing down of the oldest mosque in India, mm -hmm. all those bad things happened. So it is important to try to find out what really happened and then to decide what you want to do about it. If in fact, Rama was born there. There was still not necessary to tear, tear, tear down the mosque, but that's another that's another question. Yeah, uh, and thank you very much for uh, bringing this up because this was one of the questions that I wanted to ask you. Uh, yeah, and 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 I think you answered that already. It's like, what does one do, a scholar, like in in these current times when there's like threat ranging from harassment to persecution. Like, I mean, a Rutgers professor recently just for like uh, writing about history has faced so much pushback from uh, students. Uh, and <clears throat> when, uh, professors in India are being sacked from their jobs, uh, being jailed, uh, for like speaking out, how does one do honest intellectual work yeah. when there is such pushback? Uh, how does one move forward? Um, I um, admire the extraordinary courage of people like Romila Tapar, mm -hmm. who continue to write accurate history. Um, I, I think people in India are in danger, physical danger if they write accurate history about these difficult topics. Mm 
I think therefore it is the duty of people who live in America where white scholars who have tenure are safe. <laughs> Not everybody is safe in America either, but there, there are categories of safety. Um, Audrey Trusky can write these things. I can write these things. Um, in America, people um, are not yet being sacked for speaking out against Hinduism. They're being sacked for other stupid reasons. We have our other problems in America. Um, the Me Too un movement and the Black Lives Matter unit have produced all sorts of different sorts of problems that India doesn't have. But scholars of India in America, and I think in Europe by and large, are physically safe. And I think they have a duty to speak out because I can't ask my colleagues in India to speak out. I can't ask them to take the physical risk. Um, as long as it's a repressive theocratic government as it is, um, it's a dangerous country to tell the truth in. Um, and I can't ask someone else to be brave it amazes me that so many people are brave in India and do take the risks, people like Roman mm -hmm. Um So it's a very difficult situation. And I don't think you can ask anyone else to be courageous. You can just admire the people who are and hope that they will remain safe. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough time for researchers, and academics and scholars in general. Yeah. And for everybody, in fact. Like, yeah. But yeah, the gender, course. the gender and race politics here are getting people fired. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but generally speaking, not killed. The people who are getting killed are black people who are being killed by white police. That's a mm -hmm. entirely different problem. Mm -hmm. uh, academics, however, are being sacked for I think misuses mm -hmm. of the problems of race and gender that we're trying to correct. Mm -hmm. We're trying to find a balance there. The movement is right in its essence, but it's often carried out in an unfair manner where people are not properly tried. Um, um, and then, of course, money. Um, in America, people are not so often killed, but they're often bankrupted. Mm -hmm. uh, money, um, more than the political uses of money, are very wicked in America. Mm -hmm. um, but at the moment, scholars of India and America are usually not, uh, when I got in trouble uh, in 2010 for the Hindus, yeah. um, I had um, bodyguards when I made public speeches for a year or two. But in retrospect, I didn't need them. Mm -hmm. People said bad things to me, but nobody tried to kill me. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, then it died away. It's a different kind of a country. Um, if someone had, uh, tried to kill me, they would have gotten in trouble with the police. Yeah. Uh, in India, if someone tries to kill a, a dissident, the police look the other way. Yeah, I like mean, so there's a difference. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's like times are very difficult right now for yeah. speaking yeah. out. And then, of course, everybody's dying of this virus because of Modi's government. So, mm -hmm. so India's uh, my heart bleeds for India right now, and, and I'm very worried about my friends in India. That's, but that's another topic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, like my last question to you would be the source of this problem, like, uh, like uh, Orientalism and uh, like how censorship has worked over yeah. millennia. Like you, you talked a little about how men have often had a way more advantage over women and other minorities in speaking history. So mm -hmm. the same has worked with a colonial voice, right? Like, uh, like groups that have dominated cultures have often spoken, uh, have often been the tellers of history, right? And you encounter that in your works, like, uh, like especially in Redeeming Kama Sutra, you talked about that because most of the translations that you, you said that that are available are colonial trans right. translations. Um, so, as a historian and as a scholar uh, who deals with all these stories, um, how do you recover or try to recover some of 
the original voices. You also talk about this a little in your book about androgyny right, like uh, particularly Native American traditions, uh, you're often getting stories through a more of a colonial. <clears throat> so how do you try to recreate some of those stories where in a decolonial sense and in, in, in a decolonial manner where you try to retrieve some of the original voices? Yeah. Well, for one thing, uh, you go back to the text. So we're talking about translations of texts. Um, there are some texts we don't have. There are a lot of folk tales that were collected by the British. Um, these mem sobs in their uh, sensible shoes going around and talking to people. Um, and in some cases, they're the only sources we have for some stories. Um, in my, my most recent book about horses, which is about to be published in India, it was published here already called um, Winged Stallions and Wicked Mares. Mm -hmm. I end up with a story that was retold in the 19th and 20th century under colonial um, influence about a, a native Indian tyrant who was killed by people who come from abroad and bring horses with them. Mm -hmm. um, so this is obviously a, a story the British like to tell, right? They, they often argued that they saved the Hindus from Muslim predators and all that sort of bullshit. Um, <laughs> But it's based upon a much older Indian story about horses coming from the sea and, and fertilizing stallions, fertilizing mares, and so forth. So you can actually trace the 19th century texts and how the British kept telling, re retelling that story and how it served their interests and how it's a twist of an older story that is in fact native um, mm -hmm. to India, which is based upon the fact that horses are not native to India and that the idea of the and the imported thing being wonderful, which is uh, goes against the idea that you're being colonized by people who are simply ripping you off and destroying you. Mm -hmm. So you have this alternative myth that's kind of available in Sanskrit and then taken off by the British. <clears throat> so as a historian, you say, look what the British are doing, you expose it. You say, look how it serves their interests. Look, look how they're, they're using this Indian story to tell a very different story. Aren't we glad the British came how lucky we are to have the British here and all, and all that sort of thing. Um, so one way is to go back to the sources and to say, this is, this, this is what happened. Why is it that mo most English speaking Hindus nowadays think that the Bhagavad Gita is their most important book? Because the British said that the Bhagavad Gita was the most important book. You go back to before the British and people had all sorts of other, they had the Gita Govinda, they had um, a Tamil story. So, so you try to do the history, you try to undo the twists, the distortions that the colonial eye has done. With the Kama Sutra, we have Richard Burton's translation, which is the one that everybody uses. You go back to the Sanskrit and you say, no, the Sanskrit doesn't say what he says. The Sanskrit says this. Um, you try to undo the damage. In the case of those folk tales that the English women collected, if you don't have alternatives, all you can say is, we only have this one telling, it's a British telling, be careful how, how you use it because there may be a bias. You're, you're a little suspicious, but you can't correct it because you don't have the, the original. You might find another variant of that story from an older Tamil text and you say, this sounds more like the way the story really went. But that's uh, gets guesswork rather than science. It's just trying to find other earlier versions that fit better with what you think was more likely to be the attitude of the people telling the story. So there's a lot of your guess against their guess, mm -hmm. but you do know the British, you do know what their biases are, you do know what their interests are, so you know where to suspect mm -hmm. um, that a story is being twisted. Um, Burton uh, took away a lot of the pro-female part of the, of the Kama Sutra. Um, the, the portion that I mentioned, which is so liberal toward um, homosexual men, he calls them eunuchs, mm -hmm. that whole section. He doesn't uh, imply that only castrated men did the, so he, he, he missed the whole point there. Um, so there are important corrections that you make by going back to the Sanskrit text. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, and uh, uh, thank you for saying that. I, I myself have encountered these, like, uh, and I think Burton was also responsible for doing the Thousand and One Nights. Arabian Nights, absolutely. And 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 yeah, like when I teach that text, I don't want to. That's a very particularly tricky text where where like reading it like casually, you may take the wrong ideas of it. Yeah, he made up a lot. Of, apparently, he made up a lot of it. Yeah, so I, I, I've like encountered that in the classroom, and and that's a real challenge. And thank you for like talking about this, okay. uh, Wendy. I really appreciate your time. Uh, I know you're very really busy, and you still found time for this. And it's um, very yeah. flattering. It's always flattering to have someone interested in my work. So it was, it was a pleasure. You asked interesting questions. Some of them I hadn't thought about much, so it made me think new thoughts. And um, I'm, I'm pleased and honored that you paid so much attention to my book. So it's I who should thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh